Sometimes in life, our experiences in life with certain people taint the way we view others. And there are some in life who have a, even in a crowd like this, there are some in life who have a different perspective upon God, maybe not a healthy one because of past experience with uh, that patriarchal figure in their lives, we call them dad, that didn't go as well as they would like it to go. And that just happens sometimes in life, and I have some good friends that struggle with that and struggle for a long time in understanding who God's was and really trusting who God is and, and trusting that he truly loves them because they didn't experience that. But this morning, we're going to just take a look at some things that Jesus says about our Heavenly Father. And I think they should bring us encouragement, they should bring us hope, they should be remind us that he is faithful, that he is willing to stand by us and minister to us regardless of the situation. So if you have your copy of God's Word, follow along with me in Matthew 7, in verses 7 through 12. And if you would, in honor of reading God's Word, would you stand with me, please, for just a few moments? Matthew 7, verses 7 through 12. Give you a chance to find that in your copy of God's Word. And Jesus is continuing to, to talk in the Sermon of the Mount. And he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. And what man among you, who when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the faithfulness of our Savior as he speaks to us today. I pray, Father, you would use me as your vessel to faithfully communicate your word today to your people that we might not only understand and hear it, but begin to apply it to our lives that it might speak to us and change us from within as you transform us, not just transforming our actions, but you change our will, you change our desires, you change our motives, you change everything about us that we might demonstrate your love and grace to those whom you bring our way. Bless this time and use it for your purposes, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. It's a very familiar text for, for some of us that have been around uh, the church a little bit, and for some that haven't, it's still one you've probably heard some of these phrases before. Ask and it'll be given to you. How many of you can remember uh, back when you uh, were younger? Now, some of you are already there. How many of you remember asking for something for your birthday? Something special, right? And, you know, you uh, hoped and pleaded. I can remember those days of trying to beg my parents, you know, I saw something, I really wanted it, I thought, you know, this would be a great birthday gift for me. And I would tell them that, and I would hint. On new, it reminds me of the movie Christmas Story. Who has not seen Christmas Story? That might be a better question. If you've not seen Christmas Story, a couple, oh, you need to see the movie Christmas Story. That when it, it'll be out like, it'll be on like 24 hours from basically, what, Thanksgiving to Christmas? It's on all the time. Uh, very interesting uh, story. It's kind of different about a, a little boy who, what's, what's the gift he wants, you remember? A Red Ryder BB gun, right? And what, he, uh, he, he places all these hints for his mother, he even puts stuff in her books or magazines that she reads, like an advertisement for the date, you know, all these things. Just, and he tries all these ways to get this BB gun because it's what he wants. It's the only thing he wants. It will make Christmas what he wants it to be, right? And... Christmas goes and comes, and I don't want to give any spoilers, so I'll let you see the movie. I'll leave it at that. But that's what we do a lot of times with, with things. We think, you know, if I ask, we should. And, and Jesus tells us here to ask. To ask, and we will receive. Now, obviously, there's a lot of things we could get to. It's not asking for a, a BB gun we're talking about here, or a new house, or a new car. But he is telling us to ask. A lot of times in our walk with him as followers of Christ, and even as the church, we do not have because we do not ask. And the Scripture tells us that. Our God is faithful, he is loving, he desires to do things for us, not just to make us better and happy, but things that will draw us closer to him and help us understand and experience the life that he has for us. And he loves us more than we love ourselves, and then even our, he loves us more even than we can love our own children, which he uses that illustration here in just a moment as we're walking through the text. And as I think about this, I think about a lot of things that, that Jesus says as he tries to teach this, and I'm thinking about the crowd he's talking to at the Sermon on the Mount, mostly his followers and some people that are trying to figure out, do I want to follow this Jesus or not? And they're kind of gathered around him and he says these things and they're like, I'm not sure I, I believe you. I mentioned earlier, there are people that don't trust God because they had a bad experience with their fathers in their earthly life. They struggle to accept that anyone can truly love them for who they are. 
And we see this in this world today. I don't know if you've encountered people when I've shared my faith with people. One of the, the excuses that I get, well, you know, God can't really love me like that. That doesn't make sense. No one can love me like that. No one can love me unconditionally with all the things that I've done wrong. I'll hear people say, well, you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand where I've been. You don't understand how far I've strayed. God cannot accept me because of what I've done. And in a human sense, we, we struggle with that, don't we? But the reality is, is God is bigger than our mess. No matter what you've done, no matter what you think you've done, how you've offended him, he still gives you the opportunity to come to him because of his goodness and his great love. And Jesus wants these, these individuals, his disciples, to understand the kind of God they serve, the kind of father that they have, the one who loves them. As he says to them, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Think about those phrases, the asking, the seeking, the knocking. Those all kind of remind us of things we do when we want something, right? When you want something, you ask for it, a hope. Otherwise, you're probably not going to get it, right? You need to ask. When you, you seek, with, and there's times in life when you pursue something, it's whatever, it's a possession, it's something, maybe it's a promotion at work. Maybe it's a uh, gentleman, it's a young lady, you pursue her, you seek after her. You don't just kind of show up and think, well, she'll see me and I know she'll fall in love with me when she sees me, right? How often does that work, ladies? Not very often. We have to go beyond that. We have to make, you know, we have to clean ourselves up sometimes. We have to do the right thing when we're pursuing that young lady. We're going after her with all our heart and we're seeking her. And in that same sense, we are seeking God. He says, seek me. Ask, seek, and that idea of knocking. Nobody knocks anymore, hardly, because we have doorbells, right? Well, in our house that we lived in in Centralia, we did not have a doorbell. Uh, we were renting from some folks. They just never put one in, and so occasionally they would knock. And our dogs, as you can imagine, you've seen the three little things we have in the yard out there. Uh, they're, they're interesting. I'll just put it that way. We'll just leave it there. But when the door, and someone would knock on the door occasionally, which we knew if they knocked on the front door, it most likely was not somebody that knew us. It was somebody trying to sell us something. But anyway, they would go crazy. They would, but the, it got our attention, didn't it? Do you think we didn't answer the door just because they knocked? Well, if I was home, we well, always answered the door and would see what they had to want. Because people knock, we figure they want something, and we want to talk to them. Or maybe we don't want to talk to them, but we feel we're obligated, let's put it that way, to talk to them. Our Father wants us to ask, to seek, to knock, to be persistent in seeking from him what is on our heart. It's not because he doesn't know. It's not what Jesus is talking about here, but he's talking about a sense from us, a sense of faithfulness and a sense of persistence that we are asking, we are seeking, we are knocking. These are active words. These are words that imply initiation on our part, imply a, a sense of will, a sense of moving forward, a sense of kind of a little bit of irritation on our part, isn't it? We're trying to, we're pestering him a little bit. We want this, Lord. Let us have what we want. And he will listen. It doesn't always mean he gives us what we want, but he does always give us what we need. But he goes on here to remind us that how important this is. And then he uses this little illustration there in verses 9 and 10 that I kind of find interesting as he kind of compares him, the father, the heavenly father, to the earthly father. And he says, what person among you, if your child asked you for a loaf of bread, would give him a rock? Let me ask that question here. If your child wanted bread, wanted something to take in their lunch for school or whatever, how many of you would put a rock in there? Anybody? Nobody? No, you wouldn't do that. Why? Because that's cruel. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't show love and compassion. And then he goes on, he goes, well, how many of you, of course, most of us don't put fish in our lunches, I don't think, in our children's lunches, not, but in this day, as we know with the uh, feeding of the 5,000, it was common to put fish in your lunchbox or your whatever you carried your lunch in. I don't know if they had lunch boxes, maybe they had lunch sacks. I don't know what they had. Would you, your, your child ask you for a fish, would you give him a snake? No, you wouldn't do that. Because why? Why would you not do that? Because you love your children. You, you care for them. You would not do something that would cause them harm or cause them, even if it was a garter snake, you'd cause somebody. If you, could you imagine opening your lunch and finding a garter snake? Anybody? How many of you would enjoy that? Well, most of you would probably freak out, wouldn't you? Come on, guys, be honest. I'm not talking about a cobra. I'm talking about a, even a little garter. When you're not expect, when you're looking for, I don't know why you'd be looking for fish in your lunch, but just imagine you're looking for, maybe you're looking for a piece of ham and you got a snake in there. That would not be good, would it? And Jesus says, 
how much more does your heavenly Father know how to give good gifts to those that ask him? You, he says, us, we got all our issues. We are evil. We are broken. We are lost. And we know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more does the perfect, holy, heavenly Father know how to give good to those who ask him? How much more faithful is God than you or I could ever be towards our children? How much more faithful is he to us? He is always faithful. He is one who seeks us. He is one who loves us. He is one who knows what is best for us. And he desires and has a plan for each of us and desires to accomplish his will in our lives. And he tells us to ask. He tells us to seek. He tells us to knock. And he also tells us, do these things. I am fa- he is faithful. The Father is faithful. He will honor your request. He will speak to you because he loves you. And brothers and sisters, I dare say this is probably one of the greatest misconceptions in the church today is a great misunderstanding of the love of our Father. Because love in our own lives sometimes is conditional. Sometimes it's based upon certain things that people care for us or love us. And sometimes we ourselves do that. We, we love people and we set parameters and rules. I love you if you do these things. God does not set rules up like that. He just loves you. Even when you rebel against him, even when you reject him, even when you hate him, he still loves you. It doesn't mean he likes what you're doing. It doesn't mean he's pleased with you and happy, but he loves you regardless. That's a teaching from the word of God, consistently a thread throughout the scriptures of God's unconditional love for us. He demonstrated that in the most clear way possible at the cross, that he was willing to do whatever it took to bring us back home. He loves us completely, and yet sometimes we question that. We think, well, do you really? And you know what? As followers of Christ, we're not the first people to do that. If you look back in the Old Testament, didn't the Israelites do that all the time? What do you think's going on in the Old Testament back and forth? They followed God for a while, then they started following after the idols and other things, and then God would bring a prophet to them, he'd restore them, and they'd come back, and it was kind of this cycle. They'd go over and over and over again in the Old Testament, wouldn't it? We really see this in the book of Judges when a different time they would just follow after whatever God was out there and and do these goofy things, and then God would send in the judge to bring them back right before him. And we see that process, and yet sometimes we think, well, we've, we've gotten beyond that, right? No. There are many times in our lives that we have to understand God is faithful and God desires us but we forget that because we think, well, you know, I haven't been to church in a while or I haven't read my Bible in a while or I haven't done, you put whatever action you want in there and think, you know, I guess since I forgot about God, maybe God's forgot about me. Well, one of the things that Jesus shared right before he left this earth in the end of Matthew's gospel, you remember that? It's called the Great Commission. But do you remember what he shares at the very end after he gives us our marching orders? What does he say? For I am with you, what? Sometimes, right? I'm with you when you're good, when you're faithful, when you're nice, when you go, when you smile at people, when you're considerate, right? Is that what he says? I am with you always. He doesn't leave us because of our actions. He doesn't reject us because we have become goofballs. Is that fair? Because we have chosen our own path. He loves us regardless, and he remains with us, and he seeks to draw us to himself because of his goodness. It's not about my goodness or my worth that I should celebrate. It's about God's goodness in my life. There is not one thing that I do that deserves or merits my salvation from God or anything that, or any reason why God should care about me at all other than because of who he is. It's because of who he is that he loves me and loves you. You understand that, don't you? We say that, that's a Sunday school answer, a church thing, we know that, but we often forget it in the the throes of life, don't we? We kind of get to the point where we think, oh, God couldn't love me because I've done this, or I've thought that. God couldn't love me anymore. God would, he just doesn't want someone like me. And yet we see again and again in the scriptures God's desire to draw all types of people to himself. God's love for people and use of people, sometimes that we would wonder, really, you're going to use that person? But God continues to do that. And he goes on here and he says, in verse 12, what we know as the golden rule, he says, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way that you want them to treat you. How many of you have told your children that, parents? If I heard that once, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that from my mother, I'd have retired at 25 maybe earlier. 
because she told me that all the time. Treat others the way you want to be treated, right? We've heard that. And I think, well, that's kind of, you know, and I used to think, she said it came from the Bible, but I really questioned that till I started reading it. And then I found, there it is. It's there. It's right there. It's, and it's in, in red, so Jesus says it, right? So it's important. The significance of that, treat others as you want them to be treated. For this is the law and the prophets. You want to fulfill everything that the contain, you know, we talk about, well, how do you, if you've ever read through the books of the first five books of the Bible especially, and you get to Leviticus where it has all the laws and Exodus, all that, and you're like, how can anyone possibly obey all that? And Jesus says the heart of that is this verse. I mean, the first part is he says when he gives the great commandment in another text, what he say is to do what? Is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. On those two commandments, Jesus says, rest all the law and the prophets. Everything you need to know about following God is contained in those two commandments. And that's really what it's all about, isn't it? It's about loving others. It's about caring for others because every person you meet is a person that Christ died for. Have you thought about it that way? Even that annoying person on 270 that believes they should use the left lane to drive 20 miles under the speed limit, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you been there? You all commute every day. A lot of you have been there a lot more than I have. I've only done it a couple times. You do it every, I don't know how you do it five days a week, but you do. And you know what that's like. But God, did you know that Jesus died for that person? Every person we meet that frustrates us beyond no end, Christ died for them as well, just as he died for us. Because I'm sure there's somebody out there that I frustrate. Maybe you, you might be one of them in the audience. You, I may be someone you frustrate. I may be frustrating you right now. That's very possible. I understand that. But Christ died for us. Now, I want to go back up in these verses again because I want you to understand when he, we, we talked, I, I, don't, I don't know if I really clearly communicated what Jesus said in those first verses. Do you realize he says something twice? He repeats himself in those first couple of verses, doesn't he? He says, ask will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and will be opened to you. And then what does he do? He says it again. If you ask, you receive. If you seek, you find. If you knock, it'll be opened. Didn't you just say that, Jesus? Now think about it. If Jesus says something twice, you think there's something important there. You think there's something extremely significant that we can hang on to in our faith and our walk with him. When he says it twice in the space of two lines, he says it, he says it, and then he says again, I can remember growing up when my mother would be upset with me and she would say something to me. She often repeated herself more than twice usually, but she would say it again, so I, keep, I kept getting it. Did that ever happen to anybody else or is that just me? You know, they, she wanted to make sure I got it because she kept repeating because they say repetition helps us learn, right? And that's what we need. Well, Jesus is trying to help us understand this is significant. This is important. I'm going to say it twice. If you didn't get it the first time, here it is again. So I think it's worth revisiting for just a few seconds, that whole idea of asking, of seeking, and knocking. Because I truly believe that the reason why the church in the Western world is the way it is is because we have forgotten this principle. It's not about all the books that all the wise people write about why the church is this and all the little articles, and they're nice and they're good. There's nothing wrong with them, but it really comes down to one key issue, and this is it. We don't ask, we don't seek, we don't knock. We don't pursue God. We just kind of think, okay, God, here it is. It'll happen, and we don't pray. Oh, we don't pray like we should. Prayer is something, you know, that we just think is something that we're supposed to do, and we'll do it when we get time, get around to doing it. Does that make sense to anybody else, or am I the only person that deals with that? Can anybody in here say they pray enough? I wish I could. I really wish I could, but I can't. I pray as, I thought enough, but it's not enough. That should pray more than I, I don't think you ever pray enough. I don't think there's like, okay, this is the, you know, it's kind of like that, that thing that raises up. Okay, you've hit that threshold. There you are, you're done. You don't have to do it anymore. I think it's just a continual aspect of who we are as followers of Christ. But the reason we don't have the power to do what we do as the body of Christ, the reason that we aren't seeing the results that God wants us to see, I believe, in the kingdom is because we aren't on our knees enough. And we aren't seeking God's favor and God's power. And we try to accomplish so many things in our strength and wonder why they fail. In a couple of weeks, 
the Southern Baptist Convention, which is a part of well, the denomination that we are a part of, will have their annual meeting over, I believe it's in San Antonio, I don't remember, it was in Dallas this year. I don't, I'm not going, so I don't know where it is. It's over in Texas, whatever. And it's going to be, as they always say, they always say this every year, it's going to be a doozy. It's going to be a big one. Cause, but there has been some things, some rather earth-shattering things taking place among our denominational leaders in the last week or so. Some of you may have been aware of that, may have heard that in the news. It's kind of some, some, some things that have been said, some things that have been done that are not healthy, that are not godly. And in all honesty, this stuff's been going on for quite a while. And there's been a great need for repentance across our leadership and across all of us in understanding that we have not been who God has called us to be. And it really, I think, comes down to the issue that we have decided and thought for a long time that if we organize, if we strategize, if we do all these things that we don't need God in the picture anymore, we don't need to pray, we don't need to seek him, we can just do it if we just do it better. And I believe that is the great failing of the Western church. That's why there are churches in this country, more than I care to mention, that close their doors every week. Did you know that? On average, between 12 and 15 churches, evangelical churches in the United States, shut their doors for the last time every month. Think about that for a minute. Churches that have been around, some of them for hundred, over 100 years, and they have whittled down to just that few, and they just can't afford to do it anymore. It's just not practical. It's just not this. And so they close their doors for the last time. How sad is that? And maybe it isn't about strategy. Maybe it is part of that is strategy location, but I really believe the heart of it comes from what he's telling us here is a pursuit. Because these, ver, ver, these words are action words. These words imply pursuit. These words imply that we are seeking after God, that we are pursuing his will, that we are not passive, but we are more focused and aggressive, doesn't it? Would you agree with me? The words here are active. I'm asking, I'm seeking, I'm knocking. I don't know, what's a passive knock sound like at your door? Do you know? I don't know. I know what an active one sounds like when somebody really wants my attention. And how much more on the door of God's heart? Well, we are asking and seeking and knocking and pursuing him. Are we doing that every day? Do we understand the importance of our walk with him and the importance of our prayers and the difference that that makes? Ian Bounds, many of you have heard of him, many of you, some of you haven't, that's okay. Ian Bounds wrote many books on prayer, was a, a teacher at a, uh, a Christian college in England many, many years ago. He's been with Jesus for a long time, I think longer than any of us have been around. But he had this phrase that he would use, and I think it speaks to us. He said, much prayer means much power. Little prayer means little power. So what do you think no prayer means? And that's, is that where we are as believers? Is that where we have, have come to? And my fear for myself and for all of us is, have we kind of taken it lightly? Is, is it something about that, you know, we following God and seeking after him is good as long as we check all the boxes, but are we spending time with him? Are we pursuing him are we seeking him or is it just something that we leave to someone else to do you know as I was getting ready for this week and trying to figure out what all to say you know I do that all the time I'm thinking what what is what does all this mean this idea of, of God's faithfulness and God's prayer and I think there's one story of God's faithfulness and comes from a, a very kind of interesting situation. It's back in Genesis. There's a guy named Abram. You remember Abram? We know him as Abraham. Father Abraham, right? The song that you sing with the kids, right? You ever sang that song? How many hate that? No, I'm just... But you remember he had an incident where God told him to do something that if anything would make me question the reality and the belief that God was a loving God is what he asked Abram to do. Do you remember what he asked him to do? Huh? I'm seeing if you were awake. Or you, you studied it. It's back in Genesis. What's the thing he asked Abram to do? He said, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him to me. Do you remember how old he and Sarah were when they had this boy? They had time for plenty more, right? 
He was in his 90s, I believe, wasn't he, if I remember right? And she was too. I mean, they were up there. I mean, I don't know how it works in your world, and I I pray this never happens in ours. I don't want kids, if my wife and I lived to our 90s, we don't want any babies then. Is those okay? Other than grandbabies. Does that make sense? Anybody agree with me there? Think about being a parent for the first time at 91. Does that scare you? That terrifies me. But we have him do that, and, and, but he's been told this one child, the promise, the child, the promise. It's the only child I've ever had. He said, take him and sacrifice him, kill him. And he doesn't say, why God? He doesn't make a list of excuses. He just goes and he takes his son with him, and they go on they, the journey and the whole, I can't imagine what the journey's like, but he gets to the point where he's going to take his son's life, and I give Isaac all the props in the world because he just lays there when Because, I mean, he surely could have got away from his dad when he raised that knife, I would think. Don't you? I think he was agile enough he could have done it. But he didn't. He just laid there, and he's going to die. And then God stops. But I think about how far he was willing to go. And no wonder God calls him a man of faith. What kind of prayer life do you think Abraham had in those moments? All the way up that mountain as he kept probably pleading with God, we don't want to, I don't want to do this. This can't be right. I, I must have misheard you. Please change this. Please provide a way out of this. I don't want to. This is my only son. I don't want to do this. Do we have that same kind of urgency in our prayer life? Would we plead with God? Will we continue to go to him and seek him out? Or is it just something we do kind of like those prayers at dinner we're taught to pray. You remember, God is good, or God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food, you know, those kind of prayers. We kind of just kind of run through them. Or is there a sense of urgency about what we do? Our God is faithful. Our God is loving. Our God will listen to us when we pray. But we are commanded to pray and to seek him. As a body of believers, I'm just going to ask this question and let it lie where it lays. Are you and I praying enough and with enough fervency that God should be moved to do something in our midst? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for what you have to say here. And I also thank you for what this text has done to me this week as you've convicted me in so many ways of my own prayerlessness at times. And I pray, Father, that as a body of believers that you would focus us more completely on following you in every aspect of our walk, but especially in this aspect, that we would be those who seek you, who knock, who pursue, who are unwillingly to let go of you until you accomplish the desire you have placed upon in our hearts. Father, I believe you want to do something amazing in our midst, but oftentimes what gets in the way of what you want to do is me. And I pray, Father, you would remove in me whatever it is that stands in the way of accomplishing whatever you want to do. Father, I pray you use this time for whatever purposes you have, that our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our wills would be more attentively focused on your desires and your purposes and your goodness. For I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.